Um, just in case you've missed a Sunday or so, I know none of you have, but somebody listening in on the internet might have missed a Sunday or so. Jacob, as you remember, did some conniving and tricked Paul, made his brother Esau really angry, and really needed to run for his life. So mom and dad sent him north, traveling to the land Haran, where Abraham's kin lived, to quote-unquote find himself a wife. Yes, he was going to find a wife, but also save his life from Esau. So he's homesick, he's traveling, and as you remember, the Lord meets him in a place called Bethel, gives him a special dream about a ladder, a staircase reaching to heaven, and Jacob really knew that was an important moment, and God promised him that God was going to use Jacob to bring salvation blessings to the nations in chapter 28. So Jacob said, if I return to this place in my travels, I will know that you are the one God, and I will serve you all my days. And then Jacob watches, and sure enough, he arrives at just the right place at just the right time and has a place to stay with just the right people in chapter 29. And while he's staying there with some relatives, he, uh, you guys remember, falls in love with Rachel but has a surprise wedding to Leah. Well, he works and agrees to work another seven years and he gets married to Rachel, so now he's got two wives. And that's where we find him today. But before we jump into Genesis chapter 29 and verse 30, I want to introduce the idea, the message of the passage this way. I'm interested to see in this room who has traveled the farthest. Has anyone traveled farther than from here to Gore, Virginia? You guys think I'm tricking you. Okay. Anybody traveled far? That was for everybody. If you haven't traveled farther than that, it's time to see the world. (laughs) There are these things, these other states out there. (laughs) The continental United States. Has anyone traveled further than uh, West Africa from here? From here. Okay, just raise your hands. You're not, you know, I know you're not bragging. We just raise your hands. This is for Pastor Trey's illustration. This, I can't see this, everybody. I can't see this one. Pretend like you know the answer. Ooh, okay. How many of you have traveled further? Let's go around the world that way. How many of you travel, you think, further than India? Around Anybody travel further than India? Okay. Some of you are in Asia now. How many of you traveled... If I say traveled further than Australia, we know you're lying, right? Because we're starting to come back. Maybe we've traveled uh, further than China. Okay, how far are we? Where are you guys? How far? Japan. Okay, not much further than Japan. Where were you going to say, Heidi? Papua New Guinea. Australia. Indonesia. Indonesia. Okay. Yes, sir. South Korea. Okay. In those places where you have traveled, we're going to take your word for it because you've gone further than Gore, Virginia. In those places that you have traveled, was sin there even that far away? How many of you would guess if we ever colonized the moon that sin would be there too? How many of you guess that? How many of you say, ah, probably? Make this a little trickier. How many of you would guess that if we ever colonized Mars, that sin would be there too? How many of you think it was probably, I think sin would be there as well. Now, when you see sin prevalent everywhere you go, doesn't that start to discourage you? When everywhere you look, you see the ugliness of sin, And then all of a sudden, it's in your own home. Surprise. And it's in your own heart. Or it's in your own church family. And you think, man, there's nowhere I can go to get away from this sin. Doesn't that start to discourage you? You begin to lose hope. Are we losing? Are we losing this thing? What if you were on the mission field and even saw that in the missionaries on the mission field, there was sin? It's in the church, it's in my own heart, it's in my own house, it's it's on the mission field. Will that discourage you? I want to start with a passage that I promised to come back to. It's not in Genesis 29. It's in Philippians chapter 1. Would you turn to Philippians chapter 1 with me? The 
this is just going to get things started. I promise to come back to this later. But in Genesis, I mean Philippians chapter 1, I want to read just a couple of verses. Everybody, yes, yes, I love listening to that sound. Everyone, Bible's out, Bible's out. We're studying the Bible. Get your Bible study cards out. We're not just readers. Everybody say it. We study. We eat this thing. We eat it. We're not a bunch of baby Christians living off of milk. Somebody say, bring me the beef. We eat the beef of the word. It involves cutting, chewing. We study the word of God. And today, we're especially going to look at number two, studying its background. And number four, studying the way it relates to the rest of the Bible. You've already guessed that one of the places where this passage relates to the rest of the Bible is Philippians chapter 1. Are you with me? Everybody with me now? We're studying. We're studying. Philippians chapter 1 verse 15. Paul says, you know what? Out here on the mission field, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. What? And some also from goodwill. Well, I'm glad some of them preach for, with good motives. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. The Apostle Paul says, out here on the mission field, there is the ugliness of sin. Is that discouraging to you? There are people preaching about Jesus with awful motives. You don't even want to know. They're atrocious motives. Does that make you start to lose your grip on hope? Because our passage today wants to give hope. And if you're failing in that area today, if you're losing your grip, if you're starting to slip, say, yeah, yeah, faith, yeah, faith, I can think about today and what I need to believe and what I believed a year ago. But hope, projecting that faith into the future, that's not something I'm I'm doing really good at, which is why despair is sneaking into my life. Today's passage wants to give you hope with this promise that no matter how things look, God is at work. Would you guys say that with me? God is at work. He's at work. Even though the ugliness of sin seems to be everywhere, say it, remind me, God is at work. Genesis chapter 29. I want us to begin with a prayer together. And I want us to pray that God would restore our hope to us. Because hope is very important. Hope is what makes us smile in the midst of trouble. Hope is what keeps us moving in our faith. And without it, we will get ourselves into big trouble and succumb to the temptations of Satan. We need hope. So let's go to the Lord now and say, Lord, please restore my hope. All over the room, Lord, set me on fire with hope. Lord, fill me up and overflowing with hope. Not optimism, not positive thinking, but belief in what God is going to do in the future. Everybody all over the room, let's take a moment to be quiet and to pray for the Lord to restore our hope. Father God, you know the hearts that are trembling. You know that those who are ready to give up. You know that those who just need to be refreshed and encouraged, you know who they are seated in this room today. You also know the people that we need to go to with this message of hope. and Their need for your message. You also know the people seated in this room who are lost, and they know it. And you know the people in this room who are lost and don't even know it. I pray that you would make things clear in our minds today. 
that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit and your word and that we would submit ourselves to you in everything obeying you. Build us up and give us an unquenchable hope that makes us a resilient and persevering kind of people. A kind of people whose joy never fails, even in the darkest of times. And we pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. And the whole camp said, Amen. Now let's turn back to Genesis chapter 29. And this is a crazy mixed up passage, just like the one before it. But you know, it keeps things interesting, doesn't it? And it has to do with family. Don't you wish folks would, would just do family right? I mentioned this before. Wouldn't it solve a lot of problems if people would just do family right? Think about David. Just do, just do family right. I don't care if you're ever known for anything bigger than fa- Just do family right. If Anakin Skywalker would have just done family right. You guys didn't laugh first time I brought that up a long time ago. But you know, that, that's an illustration. Do family right. You don't have all these sequels. Don't have any, never mind. Mess it all up so we can watch the movies. And enjoy your, your misery, I guess. Because that's kind of what we're seeing today in Genesis chapter 29. Things begin on a low note, and then they don't get a whole lot better. You know all the Christian movies we make these days, you know. Somebody does something sinful and it's awful, and at the end they get a better job and more money and a bigger house. And you're like, I don't, I don't know about that one. But Genesis chapter 29, things begin on a low note. They don't get a whole lot better. We're going to identify here with Leah at the beginning, and then we're going to move towards the climax because uh, personal Bible study step number one is the study the way it was written. This is written as a narrative. It's a story, and we're probably going to find the message of the text in its climax or in its conclusion. Keep that in mind whenever you encounter narrative in the passages of Scripture. This one is narrative. We're going to work towards that climax Verse 30, Jacob also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served with Laban still another seven years. I had to read that verse from last week because there where it says that Ra- Jacob did what? He loved Rachel more than... So all of a sudden, we're all supposed to go, oh, man, that, that stinks for Leah, Right? Stinks for her, verse 31, when the Lord, when the Yah saw that Leah was unloved, he, unloved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was barren. And it doesn't say that the Lord closed Rachel's womb. Jacob thinks that's the case later, but that's not what it says. It just says that Rachel was barren. Many, many women struggle with this issue of fertility. She, she was struggled with that. It was a challenge to her. But the Lord was having pity on Leah because she was... She was unloved. And so he wanted to give her joy. So he decided to do that. So Leah, verse 32, conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Reuben. For she said, the Yah has surely looked on my affliction. Now, therefore, my husband, listen to that, will love me. Do you hear what's going on? There's this struggle to just to get Jacob to love me. Does, does Leah love Re- Jacob? Oh, yeah, she loves him. Does he love her? No. Oh, this is, this is rough. Now maybe, because I, I gave him a son, now maybe he'll love me. And so she names him Reuben, which is, look, a son. That's, that's what your name means, Pastor Reuben. So where are, where, where'd you go? Look, a, look, a son. Now, in case you missed this, everybody, you received a handout today, and all these are listed on there, because I probably won't mention all of these, but you have these on there. That's why I gave those. You can put it into your Bibles here and remember. So then, in verse 33, she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Yah has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon, or Shimeon. He's heard or hearing the Lord has heard me she names her kids after this heartbreaking 
set of events trying to get Jacob to love her. She conceived again, verse 34, and bore a son and said, Oh, now this time my husband will become attached to me because I have borne him three sons. Surely now that I've borne him three sons, surely he'll be attached to me. Therefore his name was called Levi, or Levi, attachment. I'm going to name you attachment. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now I will praise the Yah. Therefore she called his name Yudha. Praise. Then she stopped bearing. Pause. Pause in the story, right? That's a narrative cue. Pause in the story. Things begin with Leah. And the Lord looks down with Leah and says, huh, I feel for you. And the Father God of Scripture has a tender place in his heart for the unloved and the outcasts and the orphans and the widows. And he looks at Leah and he says, Leah, I want to do something for you. I want to bless you because you are in a horrible situation that you didn't have much control over. And so he opens her womb and she conceives and she gives birth to these kids. She says, surely now Jacob's going to love me. We don't know that. We don't know that. What we do have here is God is at work in Leah's life. God is at work in Leah's life. And the reason we know that, if you highlight or underline in your Bibles, is verse 31. God is at work in Leah's life because we see there a note from Moses. When the Yah saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. We have a little editorial note from Moses right there. God is at work in Leah's life. The only problem is God being at work in Leah's life starts a chain of events and things get ugly really quickly. In fact... Rachel is the first to kind of make this an uglier scene than it needed to be because she sees Leah having children. She knows Jacob loves her, so she's not worried about whether or not her husband loves her. She's worried about not being able to have kids while her, da- while her sister can have kids, and she's jealous. She wants to one-up Leah. Chapter 30, verse 1. Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, And Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, and you got to picture what this is like, (laughs) grabbing him by the collar of his jacket and shaking him, give me children or else I die. Give me kids. And Jacob's anger, uh, literally it burns, it flares. He gets mad at her. And he says, am I in the place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? And everybody go, ouch. Ouch, Jacob. Why would you? Now, friends, keep this in mind as we go through the passage. You're going to hear Leah, Jacob, and Rachel say things about having children that betray their beliefs. You know, Leah says, ah, the Lord has blessed me with children. Was she correct? Yes. And Leah says, oh, I'm going to praise the Yah. Was she correct in saying that? Yes, but keep this in mind. We know that because of verse 31, but keep this in mind. Just because they say something doesn't mean it's right or true. Are you with me? Narratives tell us what happened. They don't always tell us what should have happened. We'll come back to this in just a second. Jacob says to her, look, God's closed your womb. I can't open it up. Is that what we're told in Scripture? Jacob just decides to say that. I think most, actually more than half of what these characters say in the story about what the Lord is doing is just bad theology. Rachel talks about, well, now the Lord is helping me win against my sister. How many of you think that the Lord is helping her win against her sister in the race to have babies? Is that, is that, is that characteristic of the Lord to do that? No, okay, so you follow me? right? Some of the things they say are going to be true because Scripture says so. Some of the things they say are going to be nutty. And that was one of them, Jacob, dunderhead. Verse 3, so she said, here is my maid Bilhah. Go into her and she will bear a child on my knees that I also may have children by her. Use a surrogate. She, things are turning ugly with Rachel really quickly. Rachel's so desperate to have kids of her own that she is willing to resort to using a surrogate. Take my handmaid as a concubine, have children by her, and the knee idea is as soon as the baby's born, at the moment of delivery, 
there is Rachel receiving the baby onto her lap as if to say, this child is mine. This is my child. Have children for me through my handmaid. This was, I mean, to us, this is so strange. But to these folks in this time, it was a legal practice. It was, it was kind of custom. And it was something that you could do to, to help a family if the mother was unloved, like Leah, or maybe the mother was barren, to have children that could inherit and all those things. That doesn't make it right. Are you with me? That doesn't make it right. That's just something that they did. That's why it didn't seem so bizarre to them. So verse 4, she gave him Bilhah, her maid, as, as wife, and Jacob went into her. And Bilhah conceived and bore Jacob a son. Then Rachel said, God has judged my case, and he has also heard my voice and given me a son. Oh, really, Rachel? Really? Therefore she called his name Dan, which means judge. And Rachel's maid Bilhah conceived again and bore Jacob a second son. Then Rachel said, with great wrestling I have wrestled with my sister, and indeed I have prevailed. Rachel. So she called his name Naphtali, which means wrestle. I'm going to name you wrestle because I'm wrestling with my sister and I'm, and I'm winning now. So things turn ugly with Rachel really quickly. It's this rivalry. Can you guys even imagine this competition? And we can imagine it, I guess. But you've got to put your sh yourself in their shoes. There's a competition, a race for babies here. And one of them's trying to win the love and affection of their husband. At least that's how it starts. The other one's just trying to beat the sister and the amount of babies. And then later, Leah now is going to get involved in this too. And things are getting uglier and uglier. And look with Leah. She resorts to using her maid. In verse 9, when Leah saw that she had stopped bearing she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her to Jacob as wife. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. Then Leah said, a troop comes. So she called his name Gad, which means troop. Look at me, I got my own little army of kids. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. Then Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. So she called his name Asher, which means happy. We name you happy, boy. One resorts to this, another resorts to that, and the rivalry gets more and more bitter and more and more ugly, and it's in the home. And Jacob at this point is starting to scratch his head thinking, maybe, I'd, maybe I shouldn't have married both sisters. Maybe I should, maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's thinking about that or not. But now we reach the climax of verse 14. I think things are at the crudest point in our story here. Because here's what happens. Reuben went out in the days of the wheat harvest, and he found some mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. And everybody said, oh, yeah, mandrakes. If you don't know what a mandrake is, this is when we do our study, our background of our text. We find out what mandrakes are. And I, I, did I put a little note on there for you about mandrakes? Okay, just a summary. Mandrakes, this root, and it has uh, red and white flowers that grow off the top of it. And also a little yellow fruit on the very top. That doesn't taste really good, but because the root kind of looked like the shape of a person, folks thought that if you ate this or drank tea from it or ate the little fruit that grew, it would help you have babies. It had kind of a magical power in that way. So a lot of folks thought that. In fact, they called that little yellow fruit the love apple. The, you find out some interesting stuff when you study was what they're doing so that's why Reuben went out to find the love apple for Leah so she might eat it and uh, be able to have even more kids but Rachel catches them and sees Reuben just came in and brought a bunch of whole mess of mandrakes into Leah what hey Leah give me some of those mandrakes oh some of those mandrakes and Leah gets mad at her it says you've already stolen my husband now you want my son's mandrakes too? I mean, how many times does that come out of your mouth, right? If I had, if I had, a, if I had a dime for every time. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I'd be a millionaire. So Leah considers Jacob to be her husband, right? After all, she was married to him 
like a week before Rachel was. <laughs> like, that's my husband. You already stole my husband with your glamorous ways, and now you want to take my mandrakes too? And so Rachel says, fine. Well, you can have Jacob tonight, and I'll take the mandrakes. I'm narrating. Look at the, that's what the passage says. That's what the passage says is going on. They are wheeling and dealing. Jay, ladies, I don't know, help me out. Is Jacob worth all this? <laughs> They're wheeling and dealing over Jacob and having these babies. Fine, you can have the mandrakes. You can have Jacob tonight. I'll take the mandrakes. And the, and the ironic, the irony of all this is that Rachel... Rachel wants the mandrakes, but it's Leah that gets the kids. Because mandrakes don't do that. Right? Surprise, they don't, they don't, there's not a lot of science behind that. So, so that's exactly what happens. And then in verse 16, here you go, ready? When Jacob came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. Once again, if you had a dime for every time somebody said that to you. And in verse, at the end of verse 16, <laughs> Jacob's, Jacob protests, of course. What? Nobody's buying and selling me over mandrakes. I'm my own man. I've got way too much dignity to come into something like that. What does it tell us at the end of verse 16? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know how that looked, David, but he comes in from the field, right? Leah comes out to meet him. Hey, I bought you these mandrakes. Get in here. Okay. I don't, I don't know. We're not told a lot about other than, and he lay with her that night, verse 16. But listen to verse 17. And God, now, now dissect this with me. And God listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, God has given me my wages Wages. Remember, what was the wage? Mandrakes for Jacob. Because I have given my maid to my husband. So she called his name Issachar. She called his name Wages. Leah is now attributing to the Lord. The Lord has blessed me because I have bought and sold my husband this way so that I could have kids. And here's the kid. So there must have been the Lord behind it all. What does the passage say in verse 17? If you highlight or underline, again, this is another one of those editorial notes that Moses puts in. And God listened to Leah. What was God listening to? God was listening to Leah's prayers. God was listening to Leah's heart. She wanted to have what? Children. It wasn't that the Lord was rewarding this shrewdness and this rivalry and this weird wheeling and dealing and negotiating over Jacob. That's not why the Lord did this. We're only told here that God listened to Leah and she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. I believe the Lord is listening to her prayers for children. We got, and we, as we read through this, we've got to be careful not to just go, well, see, the Lord, <laughs> he worked through those mandrakes. Good move, Leah. We've got to be careful that we watch what is sin and what is not because we know that the Lord is light and with him is no darkness at all. He doesn't tempt people, and he himself is not tempted by anyone, James chapter 1, verse 13. You guys, you guys know this. So she called his name Issachar. So here's where I want us to pause and just do a little bit of work before we move on and close things out, because that, that I believe, is the climax. That, is, I, I believe, is the place where this is the, the most ugliest rivalry, the ugliest sin in this entire thing is that when we see this, we see that even though this rivalry is going on, God was at work, right? God was at work in Leah's life, right, everyone? We, those places where we highlighted there in verse 17 and earlier in chapter 29, verse 31, God is at work. He is at work even though you've got this ugly family rivalry going on and sinfulness, ambition, I'll trade this, and you can have that, and here's a concubine, and there's a surrogate wife. you got all this ugly sinfulness going on, this weird ambition in the family, and yet God is at work. Let's go back to that slide right before it. Will you guys read this with me? God was at work even in an ugly family rivalry. 
One, one more time and let it sink in this time. God was at work even in an ugly family rivalry. Let's leave it on that slide for just a minute. I want us to do some work because whenever you come to a narrative passage, you are told what happened. You are not told what should have happened. In order to find out what should have happened, you have to compare it to the rest of the Bible. Are you right, right everybody? Are you with me on that? Okay, so let's take just a second and let's think through this. People go, well, you see it all turned out well in the end and God blessed it. So that means all my sinful choices that led up to this moment are all justified. In other words, let me step on some country music lovers' feet out there. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. God must have wanted me to do all those sins because it led to this point. The ends justify thee, and all is well that... That's neither logical nor scriptural. Because God is most concerned with our obedience and our righteousness and our purity. He can take care of the results, can't he? Can't he, everybody? So, so as a father, and I've told my kid a thousand times, do not stick that knife in the electrical outlet. All of a sudden, I hear this scream and the fuse trips. Kids over there in the corner. Brrr. I thought maybe that would be a Hamilton kid loving this. <laughs> Crying, and then I kneel down. My God, my kid. I was, oh, I'm so sorry that you got hurt. Oh, are you okay? Scoop them up and get them out of the way and sit down and take a moment and say, I love you and I don't ever want you to get hurt. And, and then they're crying, Daddy, you were right. I'm so sorry. And I think, wow, what a tender moment we got to have because they just got electrocuted. <laughs> so I'm glad they got electrocuted? Help me out. For the, the nation of the, the United States comes together for a short amount of time and churches get filled when terrorists fly airplanes into two twin towers. So we're glad that the terrorists flew the planes into... No. What would have been the best case scenario? That my child would have listened to me in the first place and not stuck the knife into the electrical outlet. But because we live in a world that's filled with sin, does that mean that God can't work? Oh no, he's working. He's working in spite of those things. Are you with me? In other words, let me break, let me break it down. In other words, God never desires for us to sin. Ever. God never wants us to sin even if it means bringing about this result. Ever. It's never right to sin no matter what the results we think are going to happen. Now let's go back to this passage. What could Jacob have done to do this right? Sorry? Be content with Leah. Be content with Leah. And everybody quickly goes, oh, but he was in love with Rachel. Help me out, help me out. You veterans, you seniors in the room, help me out with that one word. So? So? You want to be in love with Rachel? You get all this. You get all this. Is that what you want? Heartbreak. Rivalry, the family ripping apart. Leah, the, her owner, she's at the end of her rope. These women resorting to horrible tactics. Be content with Leah. I mean, she's got pretty eyes, right? She's got pretty eyes. Say, sorry, Rachel, let's, we'll just be friends. And, and then let the Lord use Leah to bring about his blessings of children. She's having lots of kiddos. Because here's one thing for sure about Leah. She loves Jacob. In spite of the fact that Jacob's a big jerk to her. I mean, that's a pretty big quality to have in a wife, isn't it, guys? 
And remember, the Lord had promised Abraham and Isaac that they, each one of them have many descendants. How many kids did Abraham have? One. One. Remember, Sarah said, well, here's Hagar. Have a kid by him. Did that work? No, just God can use just one. We don't have to try to figure out all the results. Just obey him. Just obey him. Just obey him. And that's what we find here in this passage. Now, here's what could have happened. Be content with Leah and avoid the family rivalry, avoid the broken hearts. And so what happens is you have Jesus, on the other hand, who obeyed the Lord perfectly, and the Lord made use of his righteousness. Don't you think the Lord would like to make use of our righteousness? Instead of having to look at our lives and say, well, they're really greedy about such and such, and watch how that leads to this, and I'll make something work out of that. But it sure would be much better for them if they would just do it my way. So I want us to see, keep that in mind, everyone. Keep that in mind, and let's finish this up. Because here's the conclusion. Here's how it ends. Then Leah conceived again in verse 19, and bore Jacob a sixth son. And Leah said, God has endowed me with a good endowment. Now my husband will dwell with me. She's still trying to win her husband because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun. Afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Vindication, Dinah. Then God remembered Rachel. We're kind of summing up both of these. God remembered Rachel, and God listened to her and opened her womb. She was also praying. And she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Joseph and said, The ah shall add to me another son. What has happened at the end of all this ugly rivalry? What has happened? It's, the, it's, it's not deep. It's not really deep. It's not all that spiritual. But what has happened now at the end of this? All of a sudden, Jacob's little family became a really big family. Ruth chapter 4, verse 11 says that Jake says that Leah and Rachel built the house of Israel. And I bet if you were to ask them how they built it, they might hang their heads in a little bit of shame. But at the end of the day, look, God was at work, wasn't he? When Pharaoh had a hard heart in Egypt, did that stop the Lord from working? No. God just made use of his hard heart. When you have Rachel and Leah being ridiculous about these things. Did that stop the Lord from working? The Lord just made use of that. But don't you think that looking back, you know the character of the Lord for their own sakes, for their own hearts, if they would have just done this His way, then they could have saved themselves a lot of pain? Don't you think? Would you choose that, choose that for yourself? I would rather the Lord use my obedience and my righteousness than use my thick-headedness. Wouldn't you say that? Someone once put it this way, that God can hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. Wouldn't you rather just be a straight stick? You know what I mean? Wouldn't, wouldn't you rather just live the righteous life? God's going to work. He is going to work. He is at work. But man, these people really hurt themselves in the process because they thought they saw the end. Chapter 28, verse 14 is the place where the Lord says to Jacob, Your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And these two ladies have, through their ambition, their rivalry, have now built the house of Israel. And the Lord has been at work through it, not because of their work, but, help me out, in spite of it. In spite of it. Is that how you want to be remembered? Yeah, me neither. God was at work, even in an ugly family rivalry. And here's the message that I think we should dwell on this week. And it comes out like this, that we can have hope. We'll bring this slide, and let's all say it together. We can have hope that God is at work even when it seems like the ugliness of sin is, even when it seems like it's everywhere. You can look in this passage, and if you underline those places where I mentioned 2931, 3017, 3022, you will see that God is at work even in the midst of this ugly family rivalry. And I think that's the message for us today. We can have hope that God is at work even when it seems like the ugliness of sin is everywhere. Aren't you glad that he's still at work? The ugliness of sin is in my own heart. The ugliness of sin is in the church. 
The ugliness of sin is even on the mission field. And we start to lose our grip and say, man, we're losing. We're losing. And I lose my grip on hope. But turn with me now back to that passage in Philippians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul had to deal with the same thing. The ugliness of sin is everywhere. Everywhere. Even on the mission field. What do you do about that? Philippians chapter 1 and verse 15. Paul says, you know what? Some people actually are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. And some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add, my, add affliction to my chains. The Apostle Paul says, you think sin is just there in your city? Just there in your house? Just there in your heart? Sin is on the mission field. There are people preaching the gospel of Jesus with awful motives. And you could start to feel like, man, there's no hope. And then you have verse 18. Where Paul says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, it will rejoice. Some people preach Christ from the purest motives. Some people preach Christ from awful motives. But you know what? I'm just glad they're preaching Christ because I know that God is at work and he will do his work through the preached message. But if I was them, I think I would preach it from the right motives. And if we see that happening, we should call out those bad motives. We should point out that sin because God wants us to obey him. But the apostle Paul says, you know what? I know God is at work. Even when people do things through the ugliness of sin and bad motives, God is still at work. There is hope. We say it with me one more time. We can have hope that God is at work even when it seems like the ugliness of sin is everywhere. Let us be a people of hope. Everybody, would you say to me, God is at work? Because sometimes I look around and see sin everywhere and you say to me, Sometimes I see so much sin to myself and I just wonder how can he be at work, but you remind me. I see, I see spiritual leaders failing here and failing there and you remind me. God is at work. And I wonder about myself, ma'am, do I have the right motives? Did I do that right? I'm so weak at that. And you say, Trey, listen. God is at work. Everybody all over the room, let's take a moment and let's just pray because I believe that right now God is at work. And there are lost people in this room that need to be saved now. There are believers in this room who've been holding back in some area that need to repent of sins and say yes to Jesus. Call him boss, call him Lord, call him king. There are other Christians in this room who just need to be refreshed and need a boost of hope. And this passage gives that. All over this room, let's pray and let's remember that God is at work. All around us, even when we're not good at working, even we have little energy left, we have little hope left, God is at work. All over the room, let's pray together.